Uh, with me today are Dr. Snamita Hatungari and Ming Yu from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center, who focus on gastrointestinal cancers. Namita is a postdoctoral research fellow from Grady Lab with 14 plus years experience of translational research in tumor biology. And Ming is a principal staff scientist with 15 plus years of expertise in translational cancer research and biomarker discovery, as well as a PI of NCI funded research program on translational epigenomics. Namita and Ming uh, have recently published a paper titled Mapping the Course and Essence Phenotype of Primary Human Colon Fibroblasts, which they will tell us about soon. And yeah, Namita and Ming, please uh, introduce uh, uh, yourself and tell us more about your background and your research. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, hi. Um, yeah, thank you so much for this great opportunity for us to introduce our research. So my name is Ming. Um, I'm a principal staff scientist at Fred Hutchinson Cancer Center in Seattle, USA. And I'm really uh, grateful for, for you and for the editor for giving us this opportunity. Um, so I'll next, I'll let Namida introduce herself and then she will start uh, the presentation on just briefly going through our uh, published study. So go ahead, Namida. Thank you, Ming. Uh, yeah, as uh, you mentioned, I'm Samita Hattingari. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow here in Bill Grady's lab, and I work under the mentorship of Bill Grady and Ming over here. Um, and I have been mostly working on colon cancer and looking at how the aging process leads to um, a predisposition of cancer in the colon tissue. So with that, I can start presenting our work and our slides. Yeah, so um, yeah, thank you again. I really appreciate the opportunity that uh, Aging and the editors have given us uh, to present and talk about our work. Uh, this is certainly very exciting. Um, so the, the, the research that we will be presenting today is was published in the Aging Journal past February. And it is titled Mapping the Senescence Phenotype of Colon Fibroblasts. Um, I am the first author here, and Ming is one of the senior authors uh, whose mentorship I work, um, worked under. So I'll just start off with a very brief background. Um, so colorectal cancer, or CRC, is one of the most lethal and common forms of cancer affecting both men and women. It is mostly considered age associated and its incidence is mostly at around 65 years of age. Uh, but more recently, there has been a spike in incidence in a younger population as well. A lot has been studied about the mechanisms driving colon cancer and the most commonly known uh, uh, mechanism is the normal to CRC sequence, where the normal epithelium develops a mutation in an EPC gene, uh, rendering it hyperproliferative. And then over time, as there is an accumulation of mutations and epigenetic changes, it forms adenomas, or it has the ability to form adenomas and carcinomas. Yet only 5% of these adenomas actually uh, progress to forming cancer. And the entire uh, reason for this is not completely known. And it indicates a role for the surrounding tissue microenvironment in playing a role in this process. So in terms of risk factors, by and large, the greatest risk factor for colon cancer is age and age-associated changes. And so we looked at candidate mechanisms that play a role in aging and age-associated pathologies. And as you can see here, there are several changes that occur both at the molecular and biological levels, including macromolecular damage, epigenetic changes, loss of stem cells, changes in metabolism, et cetera. But what we are most interested in is inflammation on senescence. So what is senescence? Well, senescence is basically an arrest in cell proliferation. But these cells are still very much alive and metabolically active. So a senescent cell is characterized, first of all, by uh, inability to proliferate. It enlarges in size. There's an increase in the nf kappa uh, B signaling a whole lot of DNA damage. And uh, 
most popularly or reliably, senescence is identified by an increase in senescence-associated beta gas staining that occurs at pH 6.0. And the interesting thing about these senescent cells is that when I say they're metabolically active and alive still, they really pump out a whole lot of senescence-associated secretory phenotype or SAS, that is a whole bunch of chemokines, cytokines, and growth factors that really get dumped into the surrounding microenvironment. And then these chemokines and cytokines have the ability to go around and modulate the tissue uh, in the surrounding tissue. And so uh, they really have the ability to modulate the mechanisms that are, um, are the, are the uh, ac cellular activity and the phenotypes in uh, the local surroundings. So senescent cells play a role not only in aging, but also in normal physiology, not just pathologies. In normal, normal physiology, when you think about senescent cells, they are very transient. They get cleared up pretty soon. And so any SAS that they secrete has a very brief and transient effect. And it plays a role in development and uh, wound healing and regeneration. And in fact, it even is known to have some tumor suppressive effects. However, with age, these uh, senescent cells keep on building up. So there's a large number of senescent cells uh, which do not get cleared out because now with age, the senescent cells cannot, uh, the, the mechanisms for clearing the senescent cells are down-regulated and the senescent cells also have a lot of don't eat me signals that help them to avoid uh, clearance by the immune system. So now what we have is a persistent SAS just constantly present in an environment and having more detrimental effects. So here we're talking about the changes that are associated with age-related diseases, chronic inflammation, and tumor progression. So in the large picture of things, uh, we really this is a really important facet to understand uh, because Understanding what SASP is secreted from the senescent cells allows us to figure out therapeutic strategies that will allow us to remove these senescent cells and improve overall health, health uh, span and uh, elongate lifespan. But an interesting facet about senescence is that it is extremely heterogeneous. Senescence phenotype changes depending on the cell you're studying, the tissue it originates from, and also the stressor that is used to induce senescence. So our first question was, well, do we see senescent cells in the colon? And to address that, we used FFPE tissues from the normal colons of subjects with uh, absolutely no concurrent adenomas or carcinomas, so these are healthy subjects and also the normal colons from subjects with concurrent advanced adenomas and colons. So these subjects with advanced adenomas and colon cancers, I'd like to introduce a term called primed colon. We believe that these normal colons here are primed, that is they already have a very rich environment that is conducive for cancer formation. So when we looked at these FFPE tissues, we basically looked for stromal cells that are positively stained for phosphogamma H2AX. These are histone modifications seen here in green that occur with DNA stand strand breaks that occur in senescence. And then we negatively selected for KI67 because here you can have DNA strand breaks as part of proliferation. And that is, of course, a nuclear counter stain. And then after quantifying all this data, what we found was that indeed subjects with primed colons, that is uh, uh, subjects with concurrent polyps, adenomas, or colorectal cancer, have a buildup or an abundance of senescent cells in the stroma as compared to the healthy subjects. And I also want to point out here the amount of heterogeneity in the abundance of uh, the senescent cells as well. And then finally, we also look for an association of the senescent cell abundance with the uh, with uh, age. And we found that in healthy tissues seen here in blue, 
and also in normal in normal tissue from prime like a prime colon is the normal tissue from subjects with uh, concurrent polypsidinosis and cancer seen in red we also have an association of senescent cell growth with age and again in gray here these are just all the samples put together and again we have uh, significance in terms of association with percentage of senescent cells with age. So our overall hypothesis, again, is that uh, the persistence of these senescent fibroblasts and their SASP creates small pockets or micro niches that become conducive for cancer initiation and progression. And so the next question then is, well, what does the senescence phenotype of colon fibroblasts look like? There are several databases that have uh, data on uh, phenotypes, senescence phenotypes of different types of cells, but it's not there for colon cells, colon fibroblasts specifically. So that was our main goal for this study. So to approach this, we basically generated uh, uh, we generated uh, cell lines from normal tissue of uh, res resected from colons that had concurrent cancer. And using these normal colons, we then um, dissociated it, generated a primary cell line, expanded it, and then distributed them in four subsets. One was the non senescent control. And then we had three sub subsets within the senescence induction where we used three different methods of senescence induction. After recovery for 10 days, we then performed the beta-gal assay that I mentioned earlier. And as you can see, our three methods of induction, oxidative stress by H2O2, and then doxorubicin and bleomycin, which are genotoxic stressors, increased beta-gal, senescence-associated beta-gal activity as compared to our non-senescent cells. And this quantified to approximately 70 to 80% of our cells. So we had pretty good senescence induction. Once uh, having um, conformed senescence, we then collected the pellet for RNA isolation and RNA-seq, and also for downstream validation by qPCR. And alongside with that, we did also uh, collect the condition media, which was then used for validation studies using the Luminex assay. So coming to our results now, based on our RNA-seq analysis, uh, we found that, and, and uh, Ting and Brett here were our uh, bioinformatics uh, specialists. So based on the RNA-seq results, we found that each of these senescence inducers had a unique senescence phenotype. We focused mainly on these red dots here, which are upregulated genes, because that's what we are interested in in terms of senescence. And then we also created a Venn diagram to identify those transcripts that are upregulated up regardless of the type of inducers uh, of senescence. And this uh, common group of transcripts we refer to as core senescence profile. Now within this core senescence profile, we then looked specifically at the subset of transcripts that code for secreted proteins because these are the ones that will actually spread into the microenvironment and have the ability to modulate uh, processes. And for further validation from these secreted uh, transcripts, we then looked at or shortlisted eight different, um, eight different transcripts or candidates based on information that was available about the role they play in different types of cancer. So this is a heat map over here, and you what you see is basically the color intensity, uh, an increase in color intensity shows an increase in gene expression uh, in three different senescence induction methods compared to non senescent cells. And the data are from three independent subject derived cell lines. So we then perform some downstream analysis, uh, validation analysis, and uh, this is first of all a qPCR looking at gene expression. And here you can see that six of our transcripts were successfully validated as being increased in senescence. Again, you can see there is variation depending on the type of inducer that is used and also depending on um, the subject derived cell line as well. 
uh, two of the transcripts were not detected because they were below detection levels. We then looked at validation by of protein using the condition media. And again, we were able to validate six of our candidates. And you can similarly see heterogeneity based on senescence induction method and also in intersubject variability. So having done this, we then did a bioinformatics analysis to see what kind of um, pathways get enriched in senescence. And here are the results. And what we see here is very, very the largest pathway that is upregulated are cytokine and chemokine receptor interactions. And besides that, um, we also have the nf kappa b pathway, the TNF signaling pathway, both of which are very commonly upregulated in aging and age-associated pathologies. And finally, interestingly, we also found an IL-17 signaling pathway that is upregulated, indicating a potential change in some immune uh, mechanisms as well. So we then moved on to perform a gene ontology analysis. Here we look at biological processes, and this is a long list, so you don't need to read through everything. But what I really want to point out are just the response to chemokine, the activation of various cells. Um, this, this list removes out a lot of redundancies, but when we talk about cell in terms of activation, migration, and chemotaxis, it involves neutrophils, leukocytes, and a lot of different myeloid-derived uh, cells as well. So it really talks about, uh, it really shows us the potential paracrine uh, effects that these SAS candidates have on the microenvironment. When you look at molecular function, the topmost is interleukin-8 receptor binding. Uh, interleukin-8 or C CXCL-8 was, what, was one of our core SAS candidates that we validated. And again, there are a lot of other molecular mechanisms that are also uh, modulated in this process. So in summary here, we described a core senescent profile for primary human colon fibroblasts for the very first time. Uh, we described several candidates uh, that were validated at both the transcriptomic level by qPCR as well as at the protein level by the luminex assay. We showed from bioinformatics analysis that uh, the nf kappa b uh, the TNF pathways, both well-reported in aging and senescence, are also uh, enriched in our senescent cells in vitro. And finally, that our bioinformatics analysis also identified an enrichment in cytokine and chemokine-related mechanisms and the activation of various types of immune cells. So with this, I'll stop my presentation, and we are very happy to discuss uh, anything related to the data we presented here, but I cannot uh, stop before presenting an acknowledgement slide because um, I'm so appreciative of the entire team, um, Bill, Ming, and all our lab mates and all our funding sources and um, um, collaborators both at the Hutch nationally and internationally. So thank you. Thank you very much, A great presentation. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, very clear. I would like to ask first, uh, how can we use this um, discoveries? Uh, how can core phenotype be used in clinical practice um, and in fundamental research as well? Yeah, that's a great question. So right now we're really looking for senescence-associated uh, uh, chemokine, cytokines, and growth factors that play a role in creating this pro-conducive microenvironment and actually leading to progression of cancer. And of course, with further studies, we are very hopeful that if we identify clear drivers of senescence, they can be used as therapeutic targets and also perhaps as a biomarker uh, for identifying uh, progressors versus non-progressors. So it really helps us with a more personalized approach to treating cancer. Yeah, I also like to maybe uh, add on what Mamida just said. Um, again, great presentation, Mamida. Yeah, and, um, 
nicely. Um, and one thing I'd like to point out is, um, uh, as Mabita pointed out, colon cancer is aging related, um, sort of aging related disease, like other cancers or other diseases. And we think that um, maybe there's like the stenosis plays a role in driving the cancer. So we think maybe those like anti-aging or anti senescent uh, therapeutics actually has a, has a uh, way to be more cancer preventive, uh, especially for the older uh, generations. So again, uh, this is something we are currently exploring in the lab using the preclinical models. But we think anti-aging therapeutics actually has a has a like cancer preventive, especially for the uh, in the case of colon cancer. And we hope you like Namita point out, we not only want people to live longer, but we also want people to live healthier and hopefully cancer free. So that's our ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you. It's quite detailed. I, I want to uh, touch on this biomarker side. How is it possible to is it possible to measure somehow presence of SASP and colon? Uh, yeah. What will be your approach to this once you find the factors relevant? Yeah, so we have been actually Ming has been spearheading this project, and I've been working along with her. Uh, but we have been looking at senescence in colon tissue, particularly in early and late adenomas using spatial transcriptomics. These are still very early studies, but we have identified uh, the presence of several SAS candidates in early and late adenomas. Um, of course, we've also performed other studies such as using qPCR. We have already identified several SAS candidates, uh, IL-6, IL-8, um, and uh, MMP3, MMP1, many of them using simple analysis like a qPCR from FFP using FFP tissue. Uh, we've already done some analysis there, but now with more advanced technology, we can actually have better resolution mm -hmm. uh, using methods like 10 x VCM or GOMX. And I'll let Ming talk more about this because she's really spearheading this project, but uh, we do have a couple of targets that look pretty promising and are currently getting being prepared for publication. Yeah, so uh, yeah, again, Mina already uh, touched on a lot of the key things that we are doing at, uh, in the lab. But what I want to point out is um, our lab is also is one of the uh, kind of participating a lab in the lot, like national-wide uh, early research, early detection research network. So we already have this biomarker discovery and validation uh, pipeline infrastructure set up in the lab. And it's just a matter of um, how we can identify those prominent SAS factors and we can use our infrastructure to uh, make them fasten the, the whole uh, kind of discovery workflow. But one thing I'd like to point out is the GDF 15, like we identified, uh, Namida also showed nicely about the validation um, GD15 is very interesting. We in the past we already published a study uh, a few years ago, uh, mainly elucidating the role of biological role of GD15 in driving the uh, as a SAS factor, uh, kind of creating this microenvironment to promote cancer initiation and progression in the colon. But now we are interested in actually looking at GD15 in the uh, serum of patients, uh, especially in, for those uh, patients that we think they have a high risk of developing cancer. So we are, again, um, using our infrastructure from EDRN, and then we are trying to see if we can identify, use GD15 as a biomarker to identify those high-risk patients. And also we can maybe uh, think about doing some like uh, preventive approaches um, so this is something, again, we are actively pursuing in the lab. Thank you. I I'm curious also about uh, the relationship between senescence and uh, colorectal carcinoma. As you showed on the slides, uh, there is uh, some associations, right? Uh, so can you really predict, uh, do you have any predictive models for colorectal carcinoma based on 
uh, you know, any biomarker available at the moment, or it's or it's future only. Do you want to ask me or should I ask you? Yeah, you can go ahead. Okay. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, so um, like the slides showed, we definitely see an association of senescence burden with uh with with age of subjects over overall to a, uh, in a broad spectrum. Um, but I, I would like to add also that uh we do need to keep in mind that there are a lot of uh Confounding factors to keep in mind as well for each of the subjects. Uh, right now, we have a relatively small human data cohort. Uh, we need to expand that cohort to ensure a lot of representation of different races, ethnicities, genders, and uh, to do any kind of predictive analysis of that sort, because you can see the heterogeneity even in the senescence burden, right? So you'd need a lot of subjects which are almost outliers of in, in terms of senescence load to be able to create that really nice, um, uh, a really nice discovery sub subset and then a very good validation subset to be able to then go ahead and do any kind of predictive analysis. Um, Ming has been spearheading a lot of uh, parallel projects, so <laughs> many parallel projects and uh, some in vivo with mice models and. I'll let me continue and talk about her, her, her studies. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, again, um, I think that there must be, uh, we already have like experience or we have expertise in this field uh, looking at like how we can kind of uh, translate our findings in the lab and then maybe either build a predictive model to, um, we can actually kind of uh, identify those targets and then just develop assays and like do a more clinical validation. Um, so again, GDPT is one of the things that we are pursuing right now. But on the other hand, we also think it's also um, really important to elucidate a lot of the biological functions of the SAS factors before we can kind of uh, definitely say the essence really is driving the cancer initiation and the progression in the colon. Um, so yeah, so those are the two things mainly going on. One is more like biological studies and the other is more biomarker discovery studies. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to ask also about, uh, so I, I noticed in the paper, you mentioned that in the gut, normally there are lots of genotoxic stressors um, and which basically can induce uh, senescence and uh, late uh, colorectal carcinoma. Do you do, can do, can you recommend anything about uh, food uh, or dietary habits which could decrease genotoxic stress in our gut? <laughs> I think the most uh, common uh, sources of genotoxic stressors in the gut would probably be red meats and processed foods. Then of course there's also microbiota, um, and there's so many different things that control the microbiota and the gut, including your source of water, how clean your foods are, and so on and so forth, that uh, finally impact gut dysbiosis and the toxins that those different microbiota make. But in terms of food habits, of course, uh, less processed foods, uh, more fresh foods, of course, uh, eating lots of antioxidants, um, and um, of course, not not smoking, not drinking, a healthy lifestyle. Um, yeah, I think those are the common things that I can think of. But um, there are several other factors like where you are geographically placed, what race you belong to. We know that the African American race is more susceptible to colon cancer, particularly men. So there, there, there are several uh, other factors to keep in mind, but in terms of living healthy, just eat well, eat healthy, don't eat processed foods and meats and um, exercise. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that's a great question. Um, so I'd like to also add uh, a few points here. Is first is uh, we also have a study already uh, close to publication. This is collaboration with um, uh, like a gut microbiome a microbiologist slash physician uh, at the Hutch, and his name is Neil Day. And so 
we have this we have this collaboration where um, he's using the neurobiotic mice model, a mouse model, which is um, he can actually kind of give the mice the different microbiome in, in a mouse model of colon cancer, and also um, he actually identified again the SAS factors plays a role in in even in the like the microbiome studies of uh, this colon cancer. So really. Um, this is a study that we are about to publish. Um, but I also want to mention is um, like this genotoxic factor or the stress, um, those are from external, right? But I think again, one thing to keep in mind is um, the, the really the, the reason why the senescent cells accumulate is actually um, probably due to the fact that as people grow older, their immune system is getting weaker. So in the young people, normally the senescent cell, like Namita pointed out, they will not be hanging around, right? So the immune, immune cells are very efficiently clear them up. However, as we grow older or has, as we age, they, the immune system, they started to uh, not be able to clear up the immune cells or like it, it clear up the senescent cells. And so they accumulate, they kind of dumping a lot of SAS, SAS in the micro in the tissue microenvironment and then that's where the problem arises. So I think it's like when we talk about like how we can uh like use this mechanism to be more like a change in the lifestyle, we also need to think about okay how we can kind of boost our immune system, especially in the in the aging population. And so it's like external and internal factors, they both work together to make sure like our system is clean and we can kind of remove all those like zombie cells or we call senescent zombie cells because they should be dying, but they're still hanging around and just make sure like our body is just, yeah, is optimal. Even even we go into like the, the older or we, we grow older, right? So that's the, whole idea of um, kind of in and out approach. The score uh, SAS phenotype, uh, what what could be the commonalities between colon uh, core SAS phenotype and other tissue core phenotypes? Do, can it add anything about that? Yeah, that's a great question. So we actually did compare our core phenotype to the core phenotypes that have been published previously. Uh, I think one of the biggest data sets that we looked at was a uh, proteomic and meta analysis of uh, lung fibroblast, fibroblast and epithelial cells that were rendered senescent using different methods, just like we did. And uh, when we com compared our core fibroblast, colon, fibro colon fibroblast uh, phenotype to their core phenotype of pulmonary fibroblasts, we found a pretty large overlap in a lot of genes. Uh, many of them were genes that we had already validated, like CXCL8 and GDF15. We also compared our CORSAS to what they call a universal senescence profile. So these are commonly upregulated genes and fibr senescent fibroblasts and epithelial cells from the lung. And we again found that GDF15 that Ming was mentioning, um, you know, it's it was again upregulated common to, to all our systems. Uh, and then we also did a treatment specific uh, comparisons. So our Dr. Rubison induced senescence phenotype to a previous, uh, to another study where they used Dr. Rubison to induce senescence in pulmonary fibroblasts. And there was a 61% overlap, a really large number of genes. Again, a lot of them were core part of our core phenotype, GDF15, CXCL8, I think CCL20 as well. And then interestingly, we, we also compared to um, the aging secretome and found a lot of overlap there as well. So this was more mainly for physiological uh, relevance. We saw a lot of aging related uh, secret, secret, secretory candidates as well. And then finally, uh, there was a very recent study published by the Mayo Group, and they published a Sen Mayo set of lists, which was beautifully curated uh, 
and it is commonly identified, these genes are commonly identified in senescence and aging across mice and humans. And there was almost a overlap of around 25 to 30 transcripts. And again, um, so when you consider like a core of core kind of uh, phenotype common across across tissues, across cell types, I think one of the main things that came across was GDF15 along with a few others. Now, of course, this list will change depending on our stringency criteria. criteria. Uh, we used very, very stringent criteria. We used uh, FDR of 0.01. Mm -hmm. And so, and a whole change of a minimum of two, but really, really very, very highly upregulated genes. So uh, certainly mm -hmm. this will increase depending on what criteria we use, but we do GDF15 and a few others come up as really significantly uh, CXCLA, GDA15, and significantly upregulated in senescence across cell types and senescence invasors. Great. But just uh, want to double check about this agent secretome. When you say agent secretome, do you mean uh, some kind of database about uh, several tissues, uh, senescence, SASP, uh, or... Oh. No, no, this is using serum from subjects mm -hmm. um, of different ages. And then uh, and they did a, basically a study looking at what, which of the uh, different proteins that they identify in the serum are actually associated with each. Okay. Yeah. Great. Uh, Ming, do you want to add something? Yeah, again, the aging secretum, uh, we are very... Uh, like delightfully surprised to see uh, there are a good amount of overlap between that um, very di different study that again uh, speaks to back to the your question about like whether we can kind of take our list of uh, core SAS and then think about um, whether some of them are actually we can detect them in the serum and then think about how we can uh, like develop a biomarker assay to either like monitor the cancer risk in in the in the population, or we can actually use that as more like early early detection. Uh, so those are the things that we are actively pursuing in the lab. Mm -hmm. And I'm also curious about um, cancer senescence. So cancer cells can also uh, become senescent after treatment. Uh, do you think there will be commonalities in the core senescence cells phenotype between cancer senescence and normal colon cell senescence? So I think yes. <laughs> By the design of our experiment, I think you will see commonalities because the genotoxic stressors that we use are actually chemotherapeutic agents, bleomycin and doxorubicin. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, as we talked about, both those inducers lead to SAS candidates that are upregulated in different types of tissues. So I would think that there will be some overlap with uh, therapy-induced uh, senescence as well. Yeah, I ask those questions. I, I'm, I'm curious also about the treatment. So you mentioned uh, that um, in the paper that uh, targeting an f -B pathway uh, can be really used uh, to decrease uh, pro-inflammatory SAS component. Uh, but I'm curious about, uh, is it known anything about targeting TNF alpha uh, part of SASP or also using senolytics in general, uh, apart from senomorphic effects? From, or yeah, I'll let Ming answer this because she has actually been leading uh, efforts on senolytics and senomorphics in the lab. Yeah, yes, I'm happy to share. Um, so first is, um, again, we think Based on hypothesis, we think senescence actually, or cellular senescence, is one of the drivers, like in the at least in the colon cancer setting. Um, so again, that's the uh, that's uh, like the direction we are going is. So whether we can use um, like anti senescent therapeutics for cancer prevention or even for like cancer treatment, right? So uh, in terms of the current agent like therapeutics out there. Um, as you mentioned, there are mainly two different types. One is called xenomorphic, and that those type of uh, uh, treatments really kind of 
make the senescence in check. Um, so as you mentioned, there are like the MX Kappa B targeting uh, agents like a metformin, but we in the lab we actually are using this um, called mTORP1C1 um, uh, inhibitors called uh, rapamycin. And again, rapamycin or metformin has been so has like anti-aging effect. But now we are really testing if um, those uh, also have anti-cancer uh, effect. And so those are the kind of the, uh, we are currently using the mouse models of colon cancer and treat them with rapamycin and then just see if uh, the treatment can reduce the tumor load in the preclinical models. Uh, and the second type of uh, therapeutics we are pursuing is called senolytic, mainly just like clear up the senescent cells. And those are represented by the drug called DMQ. Um, we call it uh, the satinib and the quercetin. So uh, again, we are also that's also one thing that uh, one one experiment that we are also uh, in the lab pursuing is treat them to the mouse models for colon cancer and then treat them with the DNQ, we call it DNQ, and again, test the hypothesis if we can, by clearing up the senescent cells, we actually, again, can reduce the, the, the tumor incidence in the mouse model before uh, we actually can kind of safely say that those drugs have this anti-cancer effect. So we are hopeful, but we are very cautious. So not until we have a, a very exciting, promising data from the preclinical, then we can for sure conclude anything that an anti anti-senescent drug actually can prevent cancer or have like this anti-cancer effect. And also to quickly chime in here, mm -hmm. uh, even besides cancer, just in normal mice and also some human trials, there have been studies showing, showing that treatment um, treatment with DNQ. So this treatment is given sporadically once in a few months, and that actually very much improves overall lifespan and health span in mice, and similar results have been seen also in humans in uh, early clinical trials. So um, it is very promising, but like Ming said, in the case, specific case of colon cancer, until we get our data and see the data in our hands, it's kind of uh, we'll have to see how it turns out before we move comments. Yeah, it's amazing. You, you're already trying to understand the effect of uh, cinematics and analytics in clinical practice. It's amazing. Um, I, I'm also, I also would like to ask about, um, so I, I see you focus in the paper uh, on the mostly pro-inflammatory, pro-tumorigenic uh, SASP components. But uh, as you said, uh, transient SASP can actually be anti-tumorigenic, uh, aim, aiming clear tumor cells. Is it possible, or do, do we have anything in core phenotype, uh, any, any proteins which are anti-tumorigenic, uh, and can we really induce them with any any other drugs? Would you like to take a step? Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, again, um, I think here is the um, kind of, like Namita mentioned in the earlier slides, this like, transient um, senescence or cellular senescence is actually beneficial, right? Um, but I think what we are worrying about is this persistent senescence, like panning around in the tissue and then causing damage. Um, so again, that's that's how like the like how we design our study to really see whether those persistent um, phenotypes or SAS phenotypes um, have this like microenvironment uh, modulating effect and then how that how those attract immune cells and to create this pro-inflammatory response in the tissue. And that would lead to a lot of the like damage down to the tissue and then actually also kind of leads to the cancer initiation, um, especially in the colon. But in terms of like those transient senescent phenotype, um, uh, again, I think one thing to keep in mind is um, a lot of those like the chemokines and, and cytokines that Namida also, some of them uh, validated by Namida, but there are also other things that um, 
we haven't discussed it or we haven't shown that Manita is actually personally relevant, it's called Papa. So Papa is something like the I will let Linda and Manita talk more about this, but we think Papa is also one of very interesting um, SAS factors. And as, again, maybe Manita, you can talk more about this because that's the, the one of the study that Manita is currently leading and we are close to publication. Sure. So uh, Papa is an enzyme. It's a metallic protease, zinc um, metallic proteinase, and it's basically um, an enzyme that uh, targets IGF binding protein. So in normal physiology, free floating IGF-1 is kept in check by binding to IGF-1 binding, by IGF-1 binding proteins, right? Uh, PAPA is one of the predominant uh, enzymes that can uh, break down the IGF binding proteins and then release IGF-1. So now IGF-1 is available to bind to receptors in that local environment and um, lead to you know perpetuate downstream effects of IGF-1, many of which are uh, proliferation and also invasion, metastasis, and so on and so forth. So we found that uh, PAPA, in fact, is very rich and active. The network is very active in early adenomas, and specifically, this is based on our spatial transcriptomics, and specifically in our um, the more epithelial rich compartments, so very close to epithelial cells. Uh, so we looked at what PAPA does to epithelial cells if it is present when IGF-1 and IGF-1 that is bound to igf is present. And we found that in specifically in adenoma cells, we found that IGF-1 gets released when PAPA breaks down igf -PP. It then finds the IGF-1 receptor, so we've seen a receptor activation and downstream signaling mainly through the PI3 kinase AKT pathway. And we've seen an increase in proliferation and increase in invasion. And uh, so we've really seen these tumorigenic effects very specific to adenoma cells. In the few cancer cell lines that we've looked at, we've really not seen those effects. Of course, we've not looked at the entire plethora of cancer cell lines available out there. But in the ones that we did check, PAPA did not have as large a role as it did in adenoma. So it's one of the first studies or first candidates that we found that is almost like a adenoma, adenoma enriched mechanism. So you really just yeah, and then yeah, another thing I'd I'd like to also add on into is like because you mentioned about this like both anti-tumorigenic versus pro-tumorigenic effects by cellular senescence, right? And here I'd like to point out is um, depending on the cell type, like what kind of cell undergoes senescence. For example, there is a specific phenomena called oncogene-induced senescence and occurs in the, actually in the epithelial cells. When it does uh, happen, like KRAS is a strong, potent, KRAS mutation, again, this strong potent inducer of this oncogene induced um, senescence. And when it occurs in the colon epithelial cells, it actually induces senescence phenotype in the epithelial cells and acting as a, a more like a stop checkpoint for the cells to stop proliferating and then before the cells become new plastic. So again, if this happens in epithelial cells, if the senescence occurs in epithelial cells, it works as a break, like as a checkpoint to, to tell the cells stop proliferating and do not go becoming cancer. So in this way, cellular senescence in epithelial cells actually act as a anti-tumorigenic, like additional like proof to make sure like um, things not going bad um, down down the road. So that's one thing I like to point out as well. And then the other thing that I would like to add in here is that yes, you have these anti-tumor anti effects and then you have these pro-tumor genetic effects. But really what you're looking at it is a, a whole picture, right? The SAS pop cocktail in, as a whole from these different cell types. A lot of SAS candidates in including XCL8, CXCL1, CXCL21, CCL20, for example, they have the ability to go into the microenvironment, 
and then actually reinforce senescence by, uh, and also perpetuate the senescence. So they bind the CXCR2 receptors and activate NF-kappa B pathway in other cells and also in their in their own cells, like an autokine as well as paracrine uh, fashion. And so uh, what you end up having is this overall senescent tissue environment or an inflamed environment. And so you have a battle of anti-tumor and pro-tumor, and finally what determines things are various factors, mm -hmm. uh, including the presence of immune immune cells there. Which immune cells are the Tregs or are they more functional T cells? Is there um, uh, exhaustion of cells happening? So there's so many factors that play a role that really uh, we need to look at an overall picture, and that's where those spatial transcriptomic studies are directed towards that mainly spearheading. Mm -hmm. Thank you. It's very detailed answer. But talking about the in induction of senescent cells uh, initially, so I see in the paper you talk uh, about uh, stress-induced senescence, oxidative stress, genotoxic stress. Are there any other uh, factors or stressors or yeah, uh, uh, causes of uh, senescence induction in the gut? Yeah, so overall, uh, aside the gut, of course, there are lots of different senescent stressors, in, even in genotoxic stressors, for example, gamma radiation, x rays, UV rays. UV rays are so common in causing skin cancer, right? Uh, which is why we put so much sunscreen on. Um, but uh, specific to the pollen, of course, we have so many microbiota, we have epigenetic stress that is happening. Uh, we have different producers of oxidative stress, for example, ER, or mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, there, there are definitely a lot of different mechanisms that are happening together at the same time. Um, but since we were doing it in our experiments in a more reductionist form in our lab, we just used what we thought was the most common methods that do um, accumulate with age, both oxidative stress and genotoxic stress accumulate with age. So we ended up using those specific uh, agents for senescence induction. Okay, so um, lastly, I'd like to talk about the limitations of the study. So you you mentioned that there are lots of heterogeneity uh, in SASP, uh, in, in the cells. Can I tell uh, a bit more about uh, the causes of this heterogeneity? Yeah, sure. Uh, I can start, and then Nina can chime in. Um, so yeah, like you like you pointed out, I think one of the uh, more like limitations of our study is we did see this like heterogeneous response um, like to the specific um, uh, senescence inducer treatment. Right, that's one thing. And the second thing is we also observed like this heterogeneous um, senescence load uh, when we, if you can remember, we have we showed that um, figure showing like the percent of senescence cells we uh, defined as gamma H two X um, positive, Ks is seven negative. Um, we also see a, like quite a spread. Um, and I think that's the more like the uh, the common challenges of working with uh, human samples. Um, and this heterogeneous uh, heterogeneous response or the more like the variation in uh, percent of senescence load in from patient, I think really kind of reflects the more like um, uh, the heterogeneous uh, uh, human population in terms of like subjects, age, gender, and other demographic uh, difference. So, um, but gladly, um, I feel like uh, we still are able to see a very strong and statistically uh, significant difference when we uh, look at either their response to the uh, specific uh, uh, senescence inducers or when we compare the subjects from cancer and then compare that from subjects from, from normal um, with normal colon. So I think really, although we do see heterogeneous response, but we still be able to present a, a statistically significant uh, results in our SAS identification and validation study. So I think that's one um, kind of one limitation, but 
at the same time, we feel like our data is also uh, pretty solid and, and a strong. So. Yeah, I have nothing more to add. I think, I mean, touched on all the points. Mm -hmm. Um, also, I, I found li in limitations that uh, there is there was only one time point where you measured um, senescent uh, SAS phenotype. Uh, can you hypothesize, hypothesize about um, temporal changes? Uh, mm -hmm. Can you tell a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Again, I can, I can, I can start, and maybe I can chime in. Um, so yeah, like you point out, um, really the the SAS that we presented in our paper, it is from like a one time point, but um, but there is also the the wisdom study that we did in the lab where we didn't uh, publish this in the paper is we did check for some prominent SAS factors like one month post uh, senescence and then three months post senescence, and we really see. This like increase actually in the in the sum of the representative SAS factors in terms of gene expression over time after the cells undergo senescence. So again, we think just think about in the in vivo setting is like if a senescent cell hanging around long enough, the long they are in the body, actually they mo the more SAS factor they're gonna produce and they're gonna accumulate in the microenvironment and that the more, more damage, the more inflammatory response the SAS will elicit. And then that's where the things gonna go wrong, like leading to cancer, leading to a lot of the uh, it, like inflammations, uh, leading to a lot of the aging related pathological changes in the body. Um, but again, um, that's, that's something I we do like to point out is uh, really the degree of senescence secretion, assassin secretion, and the more like the detrimental effect does relate to how long the senescent cells around mm -hmm. in the body. Yeah, and just to add on to that, um, besides the SAS factors that we looked at, we also looked at another molecule called HLAE, which acts as a don't eat me signal. So that's a molecule that helps the cell to evade clearance. Uh, that's also something that we found increases over time with senescence. So one month, three months, and so on. HLAE keeps increasing. And uh, this we checked using uh, uh, flow cytometry, so it's surface marker expression. It's not exactly secreted that we looked at, but a surface marker. So this is what kind of tells us what the mechanism is like in vivo, or it helps us speculate that as the, it's as with time, that's how the cell finally manages to evade clearance, keep on staying on, the SAS keeps on building up, leading to a toxic and more toxic and more toxic environment, which spreads into the microenvironment and then perpetuates and reinforces it. So that's how those little pockets or niches of tumor conducive uh, environments, microenvironments are generated. Uh, and uh, maybe the last thing to discuss is uh, how do you think uh, single cell technology would uh, improve or add to the study potentially? I will let Ming answer this because she has some exciting things to talk about. <laughs> yeah, so again, the, the, that's a great question. And that's also something that we are literally currently doing in the lab is to use single cell RNA-seq and to, again, further um, elucidate the genes. First of all, what are the cell populations present in the body, especially in, in the colon? And second of all, Again, what are the gene signatures that are producing by this by these cells? So the reason I I I, I like to talk about cell type first is um although like our published paper here is focusing on the colon fibroblasts, right? But I think based on our previous studies, there are also other uh, cells undergoing senescence, um, especially the immune cells, which is surprising because we thought. Like the one, one cell type I'd like to point is like neutrophils. But we thought neutrophils are they are short lived, right? But but from our preliminary data, we actually found that the senescent signature in the neutrophils in, in the body, especially in the aging body. So we are very curious about 
about that. And that's that's why we would like to um, carry out the single cell RNA seq experiments first in the mouse models of, um, and then we want to move expand that into human and really kind of have a full picture of um, what are the cell types that have like can be senescent and again what are the skin signatures can be produced by these cells and also of course as you see like the next logical step for us is see okay whether indeed anti-senescent therapeutics would have more effect than we originally thought so those are the thinking those are the thinking and those are the like studies that we are undergoing right now yeah, and just to add on or to give us an example, uh, we've also looked at individual SAS candidates in publicly available data. So, for example, PAPA that we mentioned, uh, pregnancy associated plasma protein A PAPA. Um, this is an enzyme that we looked at in publicly available uh, data, and we found that PAPA is, in fact, very enriched in fibroblasts. So, now we know where the source is from, right? Now, it's also present in other cells, but it's mainly from fibroblasts. Mm -hmm. And if you compare normal colon versus a ad colon adenoma, a early adeno adenoma versus advanced adenoma, you can actually see that the early and advanced adenomas have higher fibroblast-associated PAPA as compared to normal uh, tissue-derived fibroblasts. So uh, even beyond just looking at the entire senescence phenotype, just in looking at individual um, SAS candidates, I think single cell data provides a lot of information and the efforts that Ming is leading here will give us even more information into how the pathogenesis actually occurs and initiation and progression of cancer occurs with relation to senescence. Great, great to see exciting new avenues. Yeah, uh, Navita Ming, thank you very much for your time. And it was very nice to talk to you and all the best. Yeah, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, we really appreciate this great opportunity for us to talk about our research and then talk about all the other exciting things happening in the lab as also um, where the next step will be. So again, we are grateful for this opportunity and we are looking forward to working with you again uh, in the near future when we have our new findings of the maybe published <laughs> in the aging uh, journal and also in other journals. Great. Yes, I Looking echo Ming's thoughts. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you guys. Yeah. What to discuss your new papers. <laughs> Thank you. And have a great evening over there. Yes. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.